In this presentation, we are going to take a departure from where we started at the beginning of the course. If you were with us when we talked about the American dream, and we're going to look at the counterpart to that, which is the American nightmare. Fundamentally, there was something wrong with the American dream. When we read our literature about romanticism and about personal fulfillment, it was based on this ideal. It was based on optimism and the belief that if you try as hard as you can, you can become the best you that you can possibly be, which is admirable. However, we have writers like Emerson, who his critics, his contemporaries, would say about him that there was an entire side of life, there was this entire aspect of being alive, being human, to which Emerson's eyes were thickly bandaged. That's to say he was blind to this whole other aspect of life. He was focusing only on the positive. They said he had no great sense of wrong, no sense of the dark, the foul, or the base. So if you've forgotten or if you weren't with us for the beginning of the course, romantic writers really emphasized the beauty of nature and the beauty of being alive. They celebrated just being human, being part of the world, and interacting with nature. Romanticism started in reaction to the Age of Reason. The Age of Reason was based on logic, based on rationale. Everything had to have a reason. Everything needed to have hard, concrete proof. The Romantics, however, relied a lot more heavily on their imagination. They felt that their imagination could free them from the restrictions of reason. So they followed their imagination wherever it happened to lead them. Now, for most of the Romantics, most of the ones we looked at, in the beginning of the year, like um, Longfellow, he wrote the poem A Psalm of Life, or Emerson himself, who wrote Self-Reliance in Nature. For most of these romantic writers, when they looked at the individual and they relied on their imagination, they saw hope, they saw optimism, they saw very positive things. However, for some of the writers, that was not the case, and their imagination took them to the dark side of human nature. So our fundamental question is, does everyone have a dark side? Does everyone have a negative aspect of who they are? Is there something fundamentally evil about being human? Which these are difficult questions to ask ourselves and they're often things we'd rather not think about. But if we're going to read about romantic writers and if we're going to stress personal fulfillment, it's only fair that we also give the other side of the coin equal treatment. So what we're going to look at is what we call the ugly side of romanticism. Now, romanticism equaled optimism in most cases. However, there were some writers, writers like Edgar Allan Poe, who focused a lot more on the darker emotions than the happy emotions. So with romanticism, you would get joy, you would get laughter, you would get freedom. With this other aspect to romanticism, with Gothic literature, we get the darker emotions. We think about greed, you'll see envy, hate, lust, things like that. And so our question is, would this make for more interesting or less interesting literature? I would argue that it would make for more interesting literature just because humans are, to a certain extent, intrigued by the things that they find disgusting, the things they find appalling and abhorrent. As long as we can distance ourselves from it, as long as we're reading it in a book or watching it on a screen, we're intrigued by it. Think about why we pay money to go see scary movies or to ride roller coasters. We don't want to die, we don't want to be scared out of our wits, but we do like to approximate the feeling. It gives us some sort of a thrill, some sort of an adrenaline rush, if you will. So as I mentioned before, Edgar Allan Poe is one of the writers that we'll look at, and he has a theory about people. His theory is that in extreme situations, humans will reveal their true evil nature. The American Gothic writers like Edgar Allan Poe are considered the brooding romantics. They're also called anti-transcendentalists, and if you were with us for the whole course, you may remember that the transcendentalists were writers who came from the romantic school of literary thought, but they placed a lot of emphasis on the individual, on the individual's connection with nature, on self-reliance, being your own person, and on non-conformity, 
So not being part of the crowd, setting yourself apart. So based on this, you probably have some predictions about what anti-transcendentalism might be about. There are three authors, probably a fourth one that we'll get a look at in the next coming weeks, Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who wrote The Scarlet Letter, and Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick. We won't read either of those works in its entirety, but you will get a little bit of an exposure to them. Now, anti-transcendentalism has three major components. The first one is that they explore the inner life of their characters in stories and poems and in novels. So rather than just focusing on their outward actions, there's a lot of focus on their mentality and their psychology. The second characteristic is that anti-transcendentalist literature examines humans' motivations for their behavior. So it's not always about the action and the plot, but the motivations behind why the characters are acting in the way that they are. And lastly, like transcendentalism, it emphasizes emotion, nature, the individual, and the unusual. Now historically, when we talk about Gothic literature, this term Goth has an origin. And originally, it referred to these Germanic tribes which came and ransacked Rome and went around the rest of Europe in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries. By the 18th century, particularly in England, the term Gothic was used to refer to the Middle Ages because it was a period that people deemed chaotic, not enlightened, and very superstitious. Gothic architecture, which arises in the 12th through the 16th centuries, um, there was a lot of emphasis on arches, vaults, what we call flying buttresses, and we have some examples that I'll put on the slide in just a moment. But you can see that as we move through history, this term goth or gothic goes through almost an evolution. And you can think about today where we use the term gothic to refer to. It's almost more of a style than anything else. So Gothic literature, you can see, characterized by arches, vaults, flying buttresses, stained glass windows, spires, and other different aspects. A lot of the architecture suggested upward movement, which hinted towards heaven, aspiring towards heaven, but which also implies that we're at a place that's far below heaven. So while it's emphasizing upward aspiration, it's also emphasizing the state of humanity has kind of fallen from heaven. So just a quick recap, the American Gothic, they did not believe that people were inherently good, like the Romantics did. In fact, they believed that humans have an innate capacity for evil. They focused a lot on psychology and motivation. They emphasized emotions, nature, and the individual. There were lots of elements um, of fantasy and the supernatural, and they also relied on their imagination to free them from the restraints of reason. A couple of gothic elements. A lot of times in this, these types of literature, you'll see grotesque characteristics, which are things that kind of take us aback, um, bizarre situations, and often violent events. The gothic tradition started in Europe. It was likely inspired by the gothic architecture in the Middle Ages. And these what we call dark romantics, they explored the fantastic, the demonic, and even sometimes the insane. You can see that the gothic conventions look very similar to what we see in modern day scary movies. You'll see a lot of murder, you'll see death, you'll see vampires occasionally, tombs, terror, torture. Nothing that's unfamiliar to us if we look at the scary movies that are popular today. Often you'll see a damsel in distress, some sort of a female character who needs saving, um, the secret passageways, curses that have been handed down from generation to generation. Oftentimes it will take place in some sort of a castle. There's usually a graveyard nearby. Priests and monks can figure in these types of literature. And a lot of times there will be a character who's either asleep, dreaming, or in a death-like state, almost like a coma. I won't go through all of these, but these are some of the symbolic details that are often used in Gothic literature that kind of hint that something creepy, something eerie is about to occur. And again, nothing too different from what you would see in a modern day scary movie. 
So, for instance, if you hear crazed laughter in a movie, that's kind of a hint that something bad is going to happen. If you hear footsteps but nobody is there, um, if the characters are all of a sudden trapped in a room, if all the lights suddenly go out, signs that are symbols that things are about to happen. Now, Edgar Allan Poe is one of the most famous American Gothic writers. He's um, one that we're going to start with reading. He does a lot with extreme plot situations, puts people in very extreme situations to explore what happens in their psychology as a result of it. Nathaniel Hawthorne, he agreed with the romantics and that you should emphasize emotions in the individual. He's actually the author of The Scarlet Letter, which deals a lot with um, sin and guilt, grief, what happens when you feel guilty for something that you've done? What type of a toll does that take on you as a person? And Herman Melville, who authored Moby Dick, he writes a lot of adventure stories that are all set on the sea and the ocean. Um, but he also deals with the issue of madness or insanity and what happens when good and evil conflict as forces. He also talks a little bit about the, the dark side of having money, about having a lot of material prosperity. Now these implications for Gothic literature in America, it's happening around the same time as Romanticism, and it actually foreshadows what happens near the second half of the 19th century, which is the Civil War. So for a while, the first half of the 18th century, things are going pretty smoothly in America, but then it breaks out into war, and the Gothic literature actually foreshadows this for us in history. After that point, it continues to affect the development of American literature throughout the 19th century and even further into the 20th century. Um, so as we begin this unit, one of the things we want to think about is why do we as humans, why do people enjoy being frightened or disturbed? What is it about this type of genre, about this literature, about these movies that we get some sort of a thrill from? So that's actually going to frame our discussion for this unit.